in Barbados. A fancy hotel on the beach, surfing, sailing, and water skiing. All expenses paid. It sounds like the star prize on a TV game show, and I suppose I ought to be over the moon. Or over the Caribbean, anyway. But here's the bad news. I'm going with Uncle Nigel and Aunt Sarah. Mom told me this morning, the new baby is due in the middle of August. And she's not going anywhere. There's no question of dad going anywhere without her. He's gone completely baby mad. If he spends any more time in baby gap, they'll probably give him a job. The point is, if I don't go with Nigel and Sarah, I'm not going to get summer vacation. And mom thinks it will be easier for everyone if I was out of the way. This is what comes of having another baby 13 years after the last one. The last one, of course was me. A note on Sarah Howard. She's quite a bit older than mom and looks it. 40 something? She's fighting a battle with old age and I'm afraid she's not on the winning side. Gray hair, glasses, a slightly pinched face, she never smiles very much, although mom says she was a hoot when she was young. She was small, dark eyes that give nothing away. Dad says she's sly. It's certainly true that you can never tell what she's thinking. She had no children of her own and mom said she was happy to take me with her to Barbados. But I know this is not true. I overheard them talking last night. Sarah. I'm sorry, Susan. I can't take him. The thing is, I have plans. Mom. But Tim won't get a vacation if you don't help out, Sarah. He'll be a good as gold and will pay his way. Sarah. It's not question of money. Mom. You said you wanted to help. Sarah. I know. But... And so on. I wondered why she was being so difficult. Maybe she just wanted to be on her own with Uncle Nigel. A note on Nigel Howard. I don't like him. That's the truth. First of all, he's such an awkward, ugly man that I feel embarrassed just being with him. He's tall, thin, and bald. He has a round, pale face, no chin, but a very long neck. He reminds me of a deceased ostrich. All his clothes came from Marks and Spencer, and none of them fit. He's the headmaster of a small private school in Wimbledon, and he never lets you forget it. All in all, he has the same effect on me as five fingernails scratching down a blackboard. I wonder why Sarah married him. August 12th. Stayed last night in NS house in West London 
a Victorian terrace with rising fog, cases packed and in the hall. We're waiting for the taxi that hasn't arrived. My uncle and aunt had quite an argument about it. He blamed her for not calling the firm that he always uses. Nigel Speedway is much more reliable. Why didn't you call Speedway? Sarah Because you're always telling me they're too expensive. Nigel Oh, for God's sake Woman, how much do you think it's going to cost us if we miss the plane? Then they argued about the packing. It turns out that Aunt Nigel is absolutely determined to get a suntan. I wouldn't have said this was possible as he has... <sighs> As he has pale, ravy, clammy skin that looks like as if it's never even seen the sun. Dad once told me that his nickname at the school where he teaches in porridge, which is, I'm afraid, more or less his color. Anyway, Nigel wanted to be certain that Sarah has packed his suntan oil and in the end she was forced to open the case and show him he has six bottles of the stuff he had those bottles that come locked together with different sun protection factors the higher the number factor the greater the protection he had oil to go on his First thing in the morning and more oil for the last thing at night. He had water resistant oil, hyperallergenic oil, and UVA protective oil, but still wasn't satisfied. Have you opened this? he asked, taking out one of the bottles. Of course, I haven't opened it, dear, Sarah said. She put the bottle back in the case and closed it up again. The taxi have just arrived. Aunt Nigel was so angry about how late it was that he smashed a vase in the hall. It was a vase mom gave to Aunt Sarah for her birthday. She's sweeping up the pieces now. August 15. Things are looking up. Barbados is really ace place. Palm trees everywhere and sea so blue it's dazzling. When you go swimming, you see fishes that comes in every shape and color and the night is filled with steel drums and the smell of rum. Beaches go on forever and it's boiling hot. At least 90. Our hotel is on the west side of the island near Sandy Lane Bay. It's small and modern, but right on the beach and friendly, and there are other boys of my age staying here, so I'm not going to be on my own. Anyway, N and S have more or less forgotten me, which suits me fine. Sarah has spent the last two days by the pool, under the big umbrella, reading the latest Stephen King. Nigel doesn't like Stephen King. He gave us a long lecture over dinner about how horror stories are unhealthy and pander to people's basis instinct. Whatever that means. Apparently, he banned goosebumps from his school. He's bagged a sun lounger out of the beach and he spent the whole day out there lying on his on his back in his baggy Marks and Spencer swimming trunks. 
He made Sarah rub Factor 16 all over him, and I could tell she didn't much enjoy it. Without his clothes on, Nigel managed to be scrawny and plump at the same time. He has no muscles at all and his little pot belly hangs over the waistband of his trunks. He has thin coating of ginger hair. I suppose he must have been ginger before he went bald. I watched Sarah sliding her hands over his chest and shoulders spreading the oil and I could see the look on her face. It was as if she was trying not to be sick. While she read and he sunbathed, I went out with Cassian, who's 13, and who's here with his family for two weeks. They come from Crouch End, which isn't too far from here, or where I lived. We went swimming and snorkeling, then we played tennis on the hotel court. Cassian's going to ask his mom and dad if we can hire a jet ski tomorrow, but he says he'll probably only pay for a pedalo. Dinner at the hotel. Aunt Nigel complained about the service and Sarah asked him to keep his voice down because everyone was listening. I thought they were going to argue again, but, unfor but fortunately he was in a good mood. He was wearing a white polo shirt, showing off his arms. He says that he's got a good foundation for his tan. I noticed that whenever he passes a mirror, he stops and looks at himself in it. He's obviously pleased, although if you ask me, he's looking rather red he says that tomorrow he's going to move down to factor 9 August 16 Uncle Nigel had burned himself he didn't say as much but it's pretty obvious we had lunch in a cafe and on the beach and I could see that his skin was an angry red around his neck and in the fleshy part of his leg. He also winced slightly when he sat down, so his back is probably bad too. Sarah said she'd go into Bridgetown and buy some calamine lotion for him, but he told her that he was perfectly alright and didn't need it. But he did say he'd move back to using Factory 16. It's very strange, this business of 10. I don't quite understand what Uncle Nigel is trying to prove. Sarah told me while he was in the toilet that it's the same every year. Whenever he goes on vacation, he smothers himself in oil and lies rigidly out in the open sun, but he never has much success. I suppose his obsession must have something to do with his age. A lot of parents are the same. They get into their 40s and off they go to the gym three times a week. Pushing and pedaling and punishing themselves as they try to put a bit of shape back into their sagging bodies. Uncle Nigel's body is beyond hope as far as muscles are concerned. But at least he can give himself a bit of color. He wants to go back to school, bronze and healthy. Perhaps for one semester, they'll stop calling him porridge. They didn't let me hire a jet ski, even though it's my own money. 
Mom and Dad gave me a hundred dollars to spend, so Kashin and I went for a walk and then played football with some local kids that we met. Before we left, I saw Nigel stretch out in his usual place. He was reading A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickinson, but the oil and sweat were dripping off his fingers and blotching the pages. He also had the sun in his eyes and was having to squint horribly to read the words. But he won't wear his sunglasses. He doesn't want them to spoil his tan. Got back to the hotel at 6 o'clock. Uncle Nigel was taking a shower by the pool. I could see that he'd fallen asleep in the sun. He was very Red. At the same time, he must have left the Dickens novel leaning against him when he dropped off because there was a great rectangle on his stomach. The same size as a paperback book, which was as white as ever. The sun lounger had also made a wicker work pattern on his back. I waved at him and asked him how he was. He said he had a headache. He also had a heat blister on one cheek. August 17. Cashin's parents took me out for the day. We drove in an open top jeep through the center of the island. Lots of sugar canes and old plantation houses that make you think of pirates and slaves. We visited a cave. We had to wear plastic hats for protection, and a trolley took us deep down into the ground through amazing caverns with petrified waterfalls, stalagmites, and stalactites. I can never remember which is which. Kazian's dad is a writer. His mom is some sort of TV producer. The two of them didn't argue, which was a change. I was sort of dreading getting back to the hotel, wondering about N and S. No surprises there. He was still out on his sound lounger and Sarah was sitting next to him, reminding him to turn over every half hour, like a chicken on a spit. She told him that he had decided he would be alright with Factor 9 again, but I wouldn't have agreed. His shoulders were badly burned and there were two more blisters on his nose. She rubbed in some more oil for him. I was surprised at how horrible it smelled. It's yellow and it oozes out of the bottle, rippling between her fingers as she rubs it in. in. Disgusting. I've been out in the sun a lot of myself, but I'm being careful. I wear a t-shirt with wide sleeves with a Bart Simpson baseball hat. I've got my own suntan lotion too. If you ask me, Uncle Nigel is out of his mind. Hasn't he heard of skin cancer? August 19. He's got a tan. It's not exactly a Mr. Universe shade of bronze, but he's definitely brown from head to toe. There are one or two areas where the skin is still a bit red, under his arms and on the very top of his head, but he says they'll soon blend in with the rest of him. He was in a really good mood this afternoon and even said that perhaps I can go on a jet ski after all. It rained for the first time this afternoon. The rain out here is strange. One moment it's blazing sunlight and the next is just bucketing down and everyone has to run for cover. But it's not like English rain. The water is softer, it's like standing in a warm shower. And it's over as quickly as it started as if someone threw a switch. Sarah took me on the bus to Bridgetown, leaving Nigel on the beach. We walk around in the port, which was jumbled of sailing boats and huge fat cruisers. 
She looked into chartering a boat for the day, but when she found out the price, she soon forgot that idea. Nigel would never agree to pay, she said. And at the same time, she sort of sighed. So I asked her something I've always wondered. Why did you marry Uncle Nigel? I asked. Oh, she said. He was very different when he was young. And so was I. I thought we'd be happy together. We went to the bar down the dock. Sarah bought me an ice cream. For herself, she ordered a large rum punch, even though it was only half past three in the afternoon. She made me promise not to tell Uncle Nigel. I went out with Cassian and also with his older brother Nick. I told them about Uncle Nigel and they both thought it was very funny. Nick told me that in Victorian times, nobody wanted to have a suntan. It was considered socially inferior. This is something he learned at school. While he got back to the hotel, Uncle Nigel was still lying there with Aunt Sarah just a few yards away sitting with her Stephen King under an umbrella. The book must have been amusing her because there was a definite smile on her face. As for my uncle, I think the whole situation is getting out of control. His new skin isn't tanning. It was burning. It already turned a violent shade of crimson. Unlike me, he hasn't been wearing a hat and a large heat bubble has formed in the middle of his head. It's like one of those white blobs you see in cartoons when Jerry hits Tom with a hammer. All the other hotel guests have begun to avoid him. You can see when they walk down to the sea. They make a circle so they don't have to get too close. I notice incidentally that he's still reading a tale of two cities. We've been here now for almost two weeks and he's still only on page 12. August 21. Bad news. Uncle Nigel has completely peeled, so now he's back to square one. August 22. Uncle Nigel spent the entire day, eight hours, on the beach, but it looks as if his new skin is refusing to tan. He has moved down to sun protection factor two. He and Sarah had an unpleasant argument yesterday, the day he lost his tan. Apparently, when they woke up, the sheets were covered with bits of brown. At first, Sarah thought it was mold or something that had flaked off the ceiling, but it was actually dead skin. She said it made her feel sick and Nigel just blew up at her. He could hear their voices down the corridor. I saw Nigel stripping down on the beach. There was a bright pink strip going from his neck to his belly as if someone had been trying to unwrap him in a hurry. This was where the old skin had fallen away, but new skin had already grown to take its place. As for the rest of his tan skin, it was obvious that he was going to lose that too. It was already muddy and unhealthy. He wouldn't move without a bit flaking off. He was doing what he could to save it. I noticed that he'd bought his that he brought down a big bottle of after sun and he was rubbing that in as if he thought it would somehow stick him back together. I didn't think it would work. August 25. Cassian and Lick left today and the hotel feels empty without them. Another family arrived. Three girls. To be honest, I'm beginning to look forward to going home. No news from mom. She still hasn't had the baby. I miss her. And I'm really worried about Uncle Nigel. 
all his old skin has gone now. It's either fallen off or it's been taken over by the new skin, which is a sort of mottled mob and has a life of its own. His whole body is covered and boiled like tiny volcanoes. These actually burst in the hot sun. I swear, I am not making this up. They burst and yellow pus oozes out. You can actually see it. Every 10 minutes, he seemed to have another boil somewhere on his skin. There are also lots there are also lots more sores on his face. They run down the side of his cheeks and onto his neck. If he had a chin, I'm sure that would be covered in sores too. And he's still trying to get a tan. This afternoon, I'd had enough. I don't often talk to Uncle Nigel. For some reason, I always seem to irritate him. But I did try telling him that he looked frankly horrible and that I was really worried about him. I should have saved my breast. He almost chewed my head off. Using the sort of language you wouldn't expect to hear coming from a headmaster. So then I tried to tell Aunt Sarah what I thought. Me. Aunt Sarah, aren't you going to do something? Sarah. What do you mean? Me. Uncle Nigel, he looks awful. Sarah. <sighs> what can I do? What can I do, Tim? I'm afraid your uncle has never listened to me. Not ever, and he's determined to get his tan. Me. But he's killing himself. Sarah. I think you're over-exaggerating. He'll be fine, dear. But he isn't fine. Dinner tonight was the most embarrassing night of my life. We went to the fancy restaurant. It should have been beautiful. The tables were outdoors spread over two terraces. We sat with paper lanterns hanging over us and the silver waves almost lapping at our feet. Nigel walked very stiffly like a robot. You could tell that his clothes were rubbing against his damaged skin and to him they must have felt like sandpaper. He didn't make sense over dinner. He ranted on about a boy called Charlie Mayer who obviously went to his school and who equally obviously was no favorite of his. He was still using a lot of four-letter words and I could see the other diners around. One of the waiters came to see what the matter was and suddenly Uncle Nigel was violently sick all over himself. We left at once. Uncle Nigel groaned as we bundled him into a hot taxi. I could feel his skin under his shirt. It was damp and slimy. Aunt Sarah didn't say anything until we got back to the hotel. Then, you can order from room service, Tim, and you'll have to put yourself to bed. What about Uncle Nigel? I'll look after him. August 27. Uncle Nigel is no longer able to talk. Even if he could construct a sentence anyone could understand, he will be unable to say it since he has now managed to burn his lips so badly that they've turned black and shriveled up. What was left of his hair has fallen out and his new skin has shrunk and torn so that you can actually see areas of his skull. I think he has also gone blind and one eye. 
The hotel manager, Mr. Jensen, had banned him from the beach as the other guests had finally complained. Mr. Jensen had a meeting with my aunt and me. He said that in his opinion, my uncle shouldn't be sunbathing anymore. Jensen Forgive me, Mr. H Mrs. Howard, but I think this is a very unhealthy situation. Sarah I have tried to stop him, Mr. Jensen. This morning, I even locked him in the bathroom, but he managed to force open the window and climb down the drain pipe. Jensen Perhaps we should call for a doctor. Sarah I'm sure that's not necessary. She said she's been trying to stop him, but I'm not sure that's true. She was still rubbing oil into him every morning and evening. I'd seen her. But I didn't say anything. I'm beginning to feel very uneasy about all of this. August 28th. Yesterday evening, Uncle Nigel ran away. He had another argument with Aunt Sarah. I heard vague muffled shouts and then slamming of the door. When I looked out of the window, the sun was just beginning to set. I saw him race out of the hotel, staggering toward the beach. He could hardly stand up straight. He was wearing shorts and nothing else and he was completely unrecognizable. He had no skin at all. His eyes bulged out of his skull and his lips had shrunk back to reveal not just teeth but his gums. Every step he took, he moaned. At one point, he staggered and fell back against the hotel wall. One of the guests saw him and actually screamed. This morning, he was gone. But he had left a bloody imprint of himself on the wall. August 30. I can't help but feel that Aunt Sarah is completely different. There has been no news of Uncle Nigel and he hasn't been seen her seen for two days. But she hasn't been worried. She has been drinking a lot of rum. Last night, she got drunk and ended up dancing with one of the waiters. I can't wait to get home. I spoke to my mom this morning. It seems I have a baby sister. They're going to call her Lucy. Mom asked me about the trip. I told her about the island and about the family I met. But I decided not to say anything about Uncle Nigel. August 31 Uncle Nigel is dead. Some fishermen found him yesterday lying flat on the beach. At first they thought he must have been eaten up and spit out by sharks. His whole body was a mass of oozing sores, gaseous, and poisoned flesh. He no longer had any eyes. What had happened was that he had fallen asleep again in the sun, and this time he hadn't woken up. The only way they were able to recognize him was by his Mark and Spencer shorts. Aunt Sarah didn't even sound surprised when they told her. She just said, Oh, and I thought I saw her smile. September 2, back in England. Thank goodness. Mom and Dad were supposed to meet me at the Heathrow Airport, but as it turned out, there was one last nasty surprise waiting for me when we finally landed. It turned out that my new sister, Lucy, had caught some sort of virus 
It wasn't anything very serious, just one of the things that newborn babies often get, but she'd had to go back to the hospital for the night, and mom and dad were with her. Sarah's name was called out over the intercom, and we loved our cases over the information desk, where we were given the news. I was going to have to stay at her house just for the night. Mom and Dad would come and pick me up in the morning. So it was back to Fulham and the Victorian Terrace. I have to say that I walk in with a certain feeling of dread. It was Sarah's house now, of course, but it had been Nigel's, and I could still feel him there. It wasn't just his ghost. In a way, it was worse than that. The drab wallpaper and the shelves stuffed with fat, serious books. The old-fashioned furniture. The heavy curtains blotting out the light and the damp smell. It was as if his spirit was everywhere. He was dead. But while we were in the house, the memory lived on. Aunt Sarah must have felt it too. Before she'd even unpack, she called a real estate agent and told him that she wanted to put the house on the market immediately. She said she planned to immigrate to Florida. We had supper together, Chinese takeout, but neither of us ate very much and we hardly talked at all. She wanted to be alone, I could tell. In a funny way, she seemed almost suspicious of me. I noticed her glancing at me once or twice as if she was worried about something. It was as if she was waiting for me to blame her for Nigel's death. But it hadn't been her fault. She hadn't done anything wrong. Had she? I went to bed early that night in the spare room, but I couldn't sleep. I found myself thinking about everything that had happened over and over again. The pieces went through my mind until a picture began to form. I rolled over and tried to think of something else, but I couldn't. Because what I was seeing now that was what I would have seen all along was horribly obvious. I have plans. That was Sarah had told my mom before we left for a vacation. She hadn't wanted me to come from the very start. It was almost as if she had known was go what was going to happen and hadn't wanted me to be there as a witness. She hadn't made Uncle Nigel lie in the sun, but now that I thought about it, she had never actually discouraged him either and his death hadn't upset her at all she'd been drinking rum and dancing with the waiters before they even discovered the corpse no it was crazy after all she had packed all those bottles the different suntan lotions she even rubbed them in for him as it lay in the darkness, I remembered the yellow ooze spilling out of the bottle, rippling through her fingers as she massaged his back. Once again, I smelled it. Thick and greasy, and at the same time, I remembered something. Nigel had said just before we'd left, he'd been examining one of the bottles, and he'd said, Have you opened this? Maybe that was what made me get up. I couldn't sleep anyway. So 
I got up and went downstairs. I don't know why I tiptoed, but I did. And there was Aunt Sarah standing in the kitchen, humming to herself. She was surrounded by bottles. I recognized them at once. Factor 15, Factor 9, and Factor 4. The water-resistant oil, the hypoallergenic oil, and all the other oil. The before sun oil. And after sun protection. She was emptying them one at a time into a large green thin. And no matter what it said on the labels, it was the same gold-colored oil that poured into the tin, and I guess that this was where the oil had really come from in the first place. Quick vegetable oil for faster frying. Big letters on the side of the tin. My aunt continued emptying the bottles, getting rid of the evidence. I crept back to bed and counted the hours until my parents finally came. For more videos like this on YouTube, please click like, subscribe, and hit the bell button. But if you're watching on Facebook, do click like and hit the follow button. Thank you, dear humans.